One of the major evolutionary developmental transitions that happened in animals was the transition of a purely aquatic lifestyle to the development of limbs that could support uh, bipedal or tetrapedal, so upright locomotion on land. So that's what we're gonna look at right now is a little bit about the genetics and the evolutionary developmental biology of limb development, specifically in fish. But to start, let's talk about a couple of the genes that we know are involved in limb development in mammals, including also chicks. But this example, of course, is from a rodent. And what we're looking at here are some stained skeletons of mice from this paper in 1999. And what they've done here is they've looked at the role that a particular gene, PIDX1, plays in limb development. And so it's known that in chicks, genes TBX5 and TBX4 and PIDX1 are involved in limb development. But interestingly, there is, of course, a difference between hind limbs and forelimbs. Think about human arms and human legs. They look different, they act different, they have different anatomy. So it's not surprising that there are genes that tend to be specifically involved in the development of forelimbs versus hind limbs. And in this case, we can see that in the mouse labeled A, the one on the left, this is a heterozygote for a PIDX1 null mutation. In other words, they have a wild type copy of the PIDX1 gene and they have a second copy that does not produce PIDX1 transcriptor protein. And that mouse, the heterozygote, develops hind limbs normally. But if you get rid of the PIDX1 gene, absolutely, the developing mouse has very poor development of the hind limbs, but the forelimbs still develop pretty much normally. And that is how, for example, you think that PIDX1 is involved specifically, or mostly at least, in hind limb development. PIDX2 is partly redundant with the PIDX1 gene. And so I'm just introducing that as a second gene that has potentially an overlapping role. Now, in the image on the right, I've expanded this image from the same paper to show panel F, which is really, really interesting. PIDX1 in the heterozygote, if you look at the right femur here, the heterozygote has a much longer femur than the homozygote. And if we look on the left side in the heterozygote, the left femur is about the same length as the right femur, but there's a big difference in the femur length when we look in the homozygote, this individual. And that reveals something else potentially about the roles of PIDX proteins in development. It's not just that they're related to hind limb development, which is true because if you're homozygous for this mutation, you definitely get a shorter right femur and a shorter left femur. But the difference in size also suggests that the PIDX genes may also be involved in left right development. In general, on the outside, humans and most animals look symmetrical from the left to the right side. But there are, of course, some important asymmetries that develop during the development of, say, a human. So for example, in this figure, we're looking at the fact that internal organs develop on one side of the body or the other. We're not symmetrical down the midline in terms of our internal organ development. Lungs, yes, but things like the liver, the stomach, the pancreas, the spleen segregate to particular sides of the body, typically during development the heart develops asymmetrically, and even the lungs do to a certain extent. And what's known at the moment about how left-right asymmetry is developmentally controlled is uh, begins with an, the expression of a set of genes or, well, yes, expression of genes that produce nodal proteins. And then subsequently, the left side of the developing embryo tends to express that same gene, PIDX2. So something very early in development initiates a cascade of gene expression that causes some genes to be turned on more on the left side of the body than the right side. And that's how left-right left, asymmetry is initiated. If we look way back 
at when limb development began, we can see limbs in the cartilaginous fishes, fishes like sharks, chondrichthys. The common ancestor of all vertebrates also then evolved into a lineage termed osteichthys, the bony fishes, like the ray finned fishes, fishes we typically think of. And then as time progressed, there were the uh, sarcoterygians, which are individuals where the limbs are developing a little bit more. Instead of forming fins in the ray finned fishes, there's an ancestor of terrestrial organisms called the coelacanth, which is sort of one of the missing link evolutionary uh, forms in that it is a lobe finned fish. And what that means is it's got fleshy limbs, fins, but they start developing a bit more of a bulky bony structure that then leads to other species like the lungfish, which seem to have slightly better developed limbs and can walk on land briefly. Well, I can move on land anyway. And then we have the fishopod, Tiktaalik, which was a fossil that was recently discovered and that is yet another sort of missing link that had that sort of bony bulky structure in its limbs, its former fins. And so that is an extinct species that isn't a currently living species, which is why its branch on the family tree of life on this phylogeny doesn't extend to present, it went extinct. But that gives us an idea about what the common ancestor of terrestrial vertebrates look like compared to aquatic vertebrates. So we can watch basically as time proceeds towards the terrestrial organisms, the development of changes in the fins that presumably evolved into limbs or what we consider limbs, arms and legs. So the question again is, how did this process happen? How do genes control limb development? How can limbs grow? How can limbs shrink, change size, change, size, change shape? The focus of what we're going to talk about today is one specific species of bony fish, a ray finned fish, the three spine stickleback. And this is a fish that's found all over the world, mainly in temperate and sub Arctic habitats. So you don't find them in the uh, tropics, you don't find them near the equator, but the temperate regions and then north and south into the sub Arctic marine habitats. These live both in marine environments and also freshwater environments. So for a variety of reasons, lots of researchers study this fish because they've undergone so many different evolutionary changes. For example, as they migrated from their ancestral marine environment into freshwater habitats. These fish in the marine populations, an example shown here on top, have lots of bony structural armor so these fish don't have scales, but they do develop underneath their skin these bony plates. And what this fish is, this is a fish, a whole fish, not just a fish skeleton, but this fish has been cleared, that is it's processed chemically so that its tissues are somewhat transparent and then stained with alizarin red, which is a stain that specifically accumulates in bony structures. And so that's what we're looking at here are all the bony structures. These are all plates that sit on the surface just underneath the surface of the skin. So you can see everywhere there's red is bony structure. So there's a little bit around the gills that doesn't have this bony protection. But everywhere else, they have this sort of armor plates that develop underneath their skin that presumably protect them from predation. And very interestingly, and this is why we study stickleback fish in evolutionary development, one of the reasons anyway, is that lots of those freshwater populations that exist all around the world in lakes that are near coastal regions usually, most of those populations have lost the ancestral trait of that bony armor. So if we stain a Paxton Lake, British Columbia, Canada fish, we don't see any of those bony structures. Nothing takes up that alizarin red dye and reveals that sort of protective armor. Also, should point out that these are called three spine sticklebacks because on the back of the fish there are one, two, and then a small little third spine there before we get to the next fin. 
So there are actually one, two, three spines on their back, the three spine stickleback. And they also have pelvic spines. So these are attached to the pelvis of the fish. And these are spines, all of the spines, the sticklebacks will stick out in the environment in water if they get attacked. And that's basically to protect themselves. It's, they're a prickly fish and it would be difficult for a marine predator to, to swallow this fish with it when it's got all of its spines sticking out in different directions. But again, in the freshwater populations, most of them have reduced dorsal spines. They're, they're still there, but they're shorter. And many of those populations have lost the production of the pelvic spines. So that's why these fish we can look at when we're talking about the evolution of limb development, because these pelvic spines in these fish are essentially their hind limbs. And the fins, the dorsal fins, which you can't see here, would be the equivalent of their arms. And as it says here, the loss of that bony plating has been ascribed in previous studies to regulatory changes in the EDA or ectodysplasin gene. And the question is, what about the loss of spines? What are the gen what's the genetic basis of the change in the length in this, essentially what is going to be in terrestrial vertebrates, a limb? How did that evolutionary change take place? I mentioned that PITX1 function has been ascribed to some of the changes in these defensive traits. And in that same lake in British Columbia, Paxton Lake, if you compare the DNA sequence of the PITX1 gene, there's no difference in the coding region between these two species. So we know that there isn't a, say, protein sequence change that's involved in this transition from the ancestral to the derived fish. That is, the ancestral condition was plated with spines, and then those tend to be lost as fish migrate into freshwater environments. They also know that the PITX1 gene is expressed in most of the regions of the body in the Paxton fish, but not in its pelvis. So it could be that a change in where the gene is transcribed and turned into protein translated makes the difference between plating and spines or no plates and no spines. So in, in some, that is, that suggests that there's a regulatory DNA sequence change that causes in the difference of expression of PITX1, maybe. That's a hypothesis. As I mentioned before, though, in this mouse study, PITX1 is probably partly redundant with PITX2. These two closely related genes maybe have redundant features. We've talked about gene duplications before and how sometimes if you have two copies of a gene, that means that they can be redundant. And so that is why, like in the mice, which I'm showing here to remind you, remember that the right side tended to be shorter than the left side when there was no PITX1 expression or reduced PITX1 because they were either heterozygous for a mutation in PITX1 or homozygous in a PITX1 mutation. And it turns out that in sticklebacks, in the pelvis reduced populations, they may have sort of tiny rudiments of pelvic spines left. And like in the mice, these fish tend to have their left pelvic spine longer than their right pelvic spine just like we saw that difference, that left-right asymmetry in PITX1 mutants in mice. So that is another piece of evidence that really suggests that PITX genes might be involved in this near hind limb development, hind limbs being the pelvic spines in fish, in the stickleback anyway. And so maybe that is, again, evidence that PITX1 or PITX2 is involved in this process. And just for fun, I'd also like to mention that um, Shapiro in 2006 did this really cool study where they knew about um, this asymmetry in the stickleback fish, Gasterosteus species, and closely related sticklebacks, the nine spine stickleback, Pungidius, the genus Pungidius. Both of those species have these populations that have reduced spines, and they all tend to have that same trend. So this graph is looking, each column represents an individual animal 
So they collected lots and lots of different stickleback fish. And then the y-axis indicates, as it says, the percent excess left versus right. So it's basically the ratio of the left pelvic spine to the right pelvic spine, where a zero would be there's no difference in length between the left and the right sides. So there are a few individuals here where the two spines, the two pelvic spines, left and right, were exactly the same length. And so that's what that indicates. If the right side was longer than the left side, that would be these individuals, where the largest individual was something like, what is that, like 30% larger on the right than the left. So you notice that most of the animals, the vast majority of these randomly collected sticklebacks had a longer left spine than right spine. And that's why these values are positive because we're looking at the left over right ratio. And it looks like one individual had a hugely different um, longer left spine than right spine. So that again suggests this trend that there's a natural asymmetry in these pelvic reduced populations pelvic spine reduced populations of there being that asymmetry related to whatever genetic condition underlies that loss of pelvic spines. And the fun part of the story, I think, is that there's another, there's a mammal, the manatee, that has undergone the same process. So mammals, most of us are terrestrial, most mammal species are terrestrial, but some mammals had another evolutionary change and they basically evolved back into a terrestrial or an aquatic lifestyle like whales and manatees. So these manatees share elephants as a common ancestor compared to fish. And so elephants, of course, have four long limbs, they're terrestrial. And the manatee actually lost its hind limbs as it's evolved back into an aquatic lifestyle. So it, like stickleback fish in the pelvis spine reduced populations, manatees also still have vestigial hind limbs. If you look at their skeletons, you can still see the rudiments of what was in the ancestor of elephants and manatees hind legs of a terrestrial organism. So the, again, the really cool part I think of this story is that Shapiro and his colleagues collected and studied um, foss not fossils, skeletons of manatees. So they didn't study live manatees. Actually, I think they did study live manatees. I don't remember this paper very well. It may be that they had CAT scans or x-rays of live manatees. I'm not sure. But regardless, they looked in the skeletons of manatees and they discovered exactly the same trend. That in this separate case of the evolution of loss of hind limbs, the remaining hind limbs tend to be longer on the left side. So their rear legs, essentially, of manatees are always, almost always longer on the left side and very rarely longer on the right side. So this really suggests that the parallel evolution of the loss of hind limbs or the regulation of the growth of hind limbs shares potentially a common trait between fish, sticklebacks in particular, and mammals, manatees, and us. So that's one of the reasons that I think this study is particularly interesting is we're looking at fish evolution, but it has potentially a direct correlation to mammalian limb development as well. It's likely that the same genes underlie hind limb development in all of those species. So now that I've taught you a little bit about the genetics and the development of sticklebacks, we need to step back a little bit and talk about how they came to be in all those freshwater environments where they lost those dorsal spines, dorsal spine, sorry, the pelvic spines. Again, the ancestor lived in the marine environment, in the oceans. And around the last glacial maximum, thousands of years ago, the weight of all of the ice on the land masses kept them depressed so that much of the land that wasn't covered with ice was underwater. And as the glaciers retreated and all that ice melted and ran off of the land, the absence of that weight of all of that ice on the land helped the land rise. And as the land masses rose compared to the ocean level or the sea level, that trapped in any little depressions in the land, some water. And those became lots and lots and lots and lots of freshwater lakes near the coastline all over the world. So essentially what happened is as the land rose and those pockets of water remained and turned into lakes, 
fish were trapped in those ponds and they couldn't get out because there were no streams that led to the ocean and vice versa. They were trapped in these landlocked lakes. So each of those lakes all around all these coastlines where it's colored red, if there were fish that were trapped there, sticklebacks in particular, those ancestral marine forms that were fully plated and had pelvic spines, those populations of stickleback fish each then became a trapped or isolated population that evolved independently of every other stickleback population. So what this represents is literally tens and hundreds of rounds of evolution, of independent evolution events with these different stickleback populations. It's like a really powerful experiment that somebody would want to uh, develop. It's a great experimental design. You take the same fish, an ancestral fish, and you distribute them in lots of different independent lakes in this case. In the, if we wanted to do this in the lab, we would use different aquaria. And we would wait hundreds of generations, thousands of generations. And in this case, again, we saw that all of those different independent freshwater populations lost the pelvic spines and lost the bony armor. So this is a great example of parallel evolution of a trait independently in different stickleback populations. And so we can compare what were the genetic changes in all of those different populations that led to the production of the same trait, loss of bony armor, loss of pelvic spine. So right now, I just want to briefly introduce you to some of the lakes that are part of the study that we're talking about. One is from Texada Island, which is here near Vancouver. That's Vancouver, British Columbia, not Vancouver, Washington. And so the Powell River is on Texada Island. So there's a population from Texada Island that we'll be hearing about. There's one from Priest Lake, which is on Texada Island. So that is one of the pelvic reduced populations. It's this freshwater lake that's really close to the ocean, but there's no way for sticklebacks to get back and forth between Priest Lake and the ocean. So those sticklebacks that were trapped there thousands of years ago have lived there in isolation and evolved separately from their marine ancestors and from all of the other stickleback populations. There's another lake, Bear Paw Lake, which is, I didn't know there was a Houston, Alaska. I thought the only Houston was in Texas, but there's apparently a Houston, Alaska. And that's where Bear Paw Lake is located. It's near Anchorage. So it's also a near coastal freshwater lake. And I love this comment from Christopher on the review of Bear Paw Lake. You know you were only here because of science. So Bear Paw Lake is famous among stickleback researchers. So I'm guessing that Christopher was probably there on a stickleback collection trip. So yeah, it might be famous only for having this population of sticklebacks. The Little Campbell River, which runs through Vancouver, British Columbia. So it's, it's actually, in this case, it's a suburban river, but you can go there and collect marine sticklebacks. So the Little Campbell River does run into the ocean. And so there may be some intermixing of ancestral marine forms and freshwater forms there. We've got Paxton Lake, which also is near Vancouver, British Columbia. And finally, again, back to Alaska near Hump or near Anchorage, Hump Lake, Hump Lake, which is again near the coast, but is, as you can see in this picture, isolated from the marine populations that still exist. So today we have all of those individual freshwater populations in those lakes, and the marine population still exists. So you can go out into the ocean, collect marine, fully plated, pelvic spined sticklebacks. And we can also contemporaneously today, go collect low plated, no pelvic spined fish from all of those freshwater lakes. You might be wondering why or what forces, we can never answer the why question in evolution or genetics, but we can ask how. But we, so we can ask, how was it? What was the evolutionary pressure that would cause fish that are trapped in these lakes to lose those traits? Why was it detrimental to have bony armor and pelvic spines? That would explain that evolutionary pressure, the force that would cause the evolution of the loss of those protective traits. One of the stories is that if you're a fresh, or if you're, sorry, if you're a marine stickleback, you want to have all of those 
defensive mechanisms like the spines and the plates along the body because ocean predators have large gapes. They can open their mouths wide and attempt basically to swallow a stickleback whole. So they might get bite from the teeth of the predators. They might get bitten. That would be a reason to have the bony armor to protect inter internal organs. And the pelvic spines is, and the dorsal spines, as I've mentioned, are to basically protect against the swallowing whole of the fish. That would basically stab the predator in the mouth and that would cause them to spit the sticker back out, presumably. The story goes, and this is just a hypothesis, that the reason that those traits might not be as useful in freshwater environments are that they're different predators. And there aren't these large gate predators in lots of those freshwater lakes. They have smaller predators like crayfish and like dragonfly larvae. And so it might be, there are two thoughts. One is that if you have that bony armor, there's a benefit of that, but there's also a trade-off. So what's the cost of producing all that bony armor? Well, it definitely takes up cellular resources. So that's one thought is that maybe there's either a lack of resources, nutrient availability in these lakes, so the sticklebacks can't sort of bioenergetically afford to produce the plates. Or it, likewise, it could be that there's a lack of calcium because these are freshwater lakes. And so there's not enough mineral to produce the bony armor in those freshwater environments where it's plentiful in the marine ocean environment. Another thing about the bony armor is presumably it makes the fish, the stickleback, less flexible. It can't bend as quickly. So in the open water where you can potentially see um, predators coming, the startle response or the reflex when you see a predator isn't as important because they can see them coming from farther away. And because, so they don't need to be able to turn rapidly and have an escape swim from an approaching predator. But that's different in freshwater lakes where sometimes the water is much murkier and it's harder to see predators coming. So they need to have a faster startle response when they suddenly see a predator nearby. And it's known that these different species of fish or different populations rather, the three-spine stickleback, have different startle responses. They swim differently when they're attacked. And these fish are much more flexible, presumably because they don't have that rigid armor running down their flanks. So they can turn faster and swim in the opposite direction of the approaching predator better. So that could be another reason why it would be detrimental in a freshwater environment to have all that bulky, bony, rigid armor. Finally, again, back to predators, it is known that dragonfly larvae will grab onto the dorsal spines of sticklebacks and hold on to them that way to prey on them. When the dragonfly larvae are scary, they'll actually eat small sticklebacks, which I never knew an invertebrate could, but scary. So here are some shots of sticklebacks. There's that example of a dragonfly larva grabbing onto a dorsal spine of a now dead stickleback fish. And we've got uh, three different shots of birds. And you, so you can see, maybe if you zoom in, the dorsal spines or the pelvic spines, excuse me, are erect. And so you can see that here in this picture too, where you could imagine that if you were a bird or a fish trying to swallow this really spiny, spiky fish, you might not want to do that. So this is one more view of the difference between a fish with a normal pelvis. So again, this is staining from bone. You can see the pelvis and those long pelvic spines. And in many of these freshwater lakes, again, not only are the dorsal spines reduced in size, but that entire bony structure, including the pelvis and then the spines, which are attached to the pelvis, don't form at all. And this, again, has happened multiple times independently in all of those freshwater lakes. So we're going to see these different populations of fish, I'm just providing this table so that you can keep track of them if you want to. The Salmon River and there's the Little Campbell River, which I already mentioned. Those are both complete pelvis populations, including pelvic spines. We're going to look at the Japan Marine or JAMA population, which is a marine ancestral population, so it also has a complete pelvis and spines. You looked at Bear Paw Lake, which has reduced pelvis that's not completely gone but it's much smaller 
The same for the Paxton benthic fish has low pelvis development. Interestingly, for those of us that are in Fresno, there's a famous population of sticklebacks that live in the San Joaquin River, and you can go to Fryant, just a few miles up the road and collect them. Those are a freshwater population that is completely pelvis. So this is a population that lives in freshwater that didn't lose its pelvis and the pelvic spines. And then finally, again, Hump Lake from Alaska has that freshwater phenotype of a reduced pelvis. There's something to think about. If we wanted to understand something about how the loss of pelvis and pelvic spines occurs in sort of a genetic fashion, what mutation would cause that change in a phenotype? What do you think would happen if we mate a completely pelvis fish with a freshwater population fish that has a reduced pelvis? What do you think the offspring are going to look like? And how might your answer to that question depend on whether or not the mutation is a cis regulatory mutation or a trans regulatory mutation that causes that reduced pelvis development? As you take a look at this manuscript that we're going to read, keep these questions in mind. And I want to close with a new concept in molecular evolution. And this is a way that we can tell whether natural selection might be acting on a gene. That is, if a mutation on, in, or near a gene is favorable or disfavorable to an organism. This is a concept that you'll see in this paper. And I'm going to use a simple model to represent this concept. So what I'm showing here are cartoons, each line representing a chromosome from five different individuals. So this would be individual one's chromosome, individual two, three, four, and five, and all five of these are the same species. It doesn't matter what species it is. There's five random individuals from one species, and they live in the same place. So these are members of one population. And we can see that each of these individuals is genetically different because each asterisk represents a point mutation, let's say a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism where one nucleotide has changed into a different nucleotide. So you could think of this, for example, as maybe that individual has an A, but the consensus nucleotide, the one that is common in the population, is a G, okay? So in this case, each of the five individuals is genetically unique. Most of the DNA sequence of all of these chromosomes is the same because they are members of the same species. They descend from the same common ancestor. So they're genetically very similar, but each individual has, in this model, one genetic difference. The blue ones I've indicated are neutral, that is, it doesn't matter to the fitness of the organism, to their ability to survive, reproduce. It doesn't matter whether or not there's an A or a G there. So the blue mutations are neutral. It doesn't affect the health or the fitness of these four individuals that they have that point mutation. And then I've added this additional black mutation that's beneficial. So imagine that the genetic difference in this individual, human, fish, whatever, makes it more fit than the others. It can have more children, for example. What's going to happen as this population grows and we look at future generations of chromosomes in this population? So as time passes, how are the chromosomes that are represented in the population going to change? What's going to happen is we're going to see that this chromosome and the individual that contains it, or the individual, yes, the individual that has this chromosome is going to, because this is beneficial, have more kids on average than the other four individuals do that don't have that beneficial mutation. So as time goes on, and as additional generations are produced, generation after generation, what we should see is over time, more individuals in the population should have that beneficial chromosome because it conferred an advantage on the organism that had it. So after time passes, we see now if we go back into the same population, let's say 100 generations later, and we collect again five random individuals, we're going to see that three of the five individuals that we randomly looked at, randomly chose to look at, have that mutation. But what has this done to those blue asterisks? 
and this is the key point here, is that because this mutation is favorable and it spreads through the population over time, generation after generation, what's happening is there is less genetic variation elsewhere nearby on the same chromosome because the individuals that had those other blue mutations that were neutral, they didn't improve or reduce the quality of life, the fitness of those individuals, those are no longer in the population. The individuals that had those distinctive blue mutations, their lineages went extinct. They're underrepresented in the population now. So as time passes, as this one mutation becomes more prevalent in the population, it increases in frequency, at the same time, necessarily, all of the genetic variation near it on the chromosome is going to disappear because individuals that didn't have that chromosome are relatively going extinct. They're having fewer kids and passing on fewer versions of the chromosome than the individual that originally had this beneficial mutation. And eventually, what will happen if this is a really beneficial mutation is that it will fix meaning that mutation will go to 100% frequency. That is every individual, every member of that population or that species will have that beneficial mutation. And so what's happened is if natural selection is acting to increase the frequency of a specific mutation that's beneficial, we should expect that there will be very little genetic diversity around that mutation because it increased in frequency rapidly. That chromosome spread from kids to grandkids to great grandkids to great great grandkids in a short number of generations. So there's no new mutations, new, no new point mutations that happen normally during DNA replication yet near that beneficial mutation because there hasn't been enough, there haven't been enough generations for those really rare random point mutations to occur and to start to accumulate again. So, to look for signatures of selection on a mutation. Scientists look for a mutation that they think is beneficial. And then what they do is they look in the DNA sequences immediately surrounding that beneficial, pre presumably beneficial mutation. And they look for lack of genetic variation in the chromosome sequences near that candidate mutation. And if that's a pattern that's observed, that suggests that what has happened is called a selective sweep that this mutation has been selected on and it has swept rapidly through the population. That's a new term for us, a selective sweep. Suggests that a mutation has occurred that's beneficial in the environment that this population finds itself in. So it spreads rapidly from generation to generation through the population because the individuals that have this mutation are fit and individuals that don't are less fit. And so their lineages the lineages of those families, for example, that don't contain this mutation go extinct relatively quickly. And that reduces the genetic variation around the mutation that is undergoing a selective sweep.